I think we're all, we're all here today. I'll do a quick introduction here, and then we'll uh, pass the mic down the road. Uh, first, we have uh, John Nenger. He's the Executive Deputy Commander for the uh, Army Materiel Command. Um, most of you know uh, Lieutenant General Ray Mason, uh, the Army G4. Uh, Chris Carlisle, with a broken wing, right, uh, from uh, the uh, Army Special Assistant to the uh, CG, the Army Material Command. Kevin Fahey uh, from uh, TACOM, the PEO for Combat, Combat Service Support. Mickey Plunkett uh, from the uh, House Armed Services Committee. And Mark Sigarelli from uh, um, uh, BAE, BAE, Systems. BAE Systems. I was looking, we're, we're short. Uh, Mike Cannon from General Dynamics, I don't know if he's out there or not. And if he does come, uh, please come up and join us. Well, thanks, uh, Jamie, and thanks, AUSA, for uh, arranging to have this, this panel discussion. What I'd like to do is I think we ought to start by asking ourselves a question. You know, what makes the discussion we're about to have here this morning uh, so important? And more importantly, why should anyone outside this room care about the, the conditions being faced by our industrial base, be it government or private sector, and the difficult choices that are going to have to be made and are being made as production declines uh, due to a lessening wartime demand and a decreasing acquisition budget. I would hypothesize and offer a simple answer and by saying that the industrial base uh, builds and sustains combat power. It provides readiness for our, our joint warfighting forces, and it makes it possible for those military formations to operate and succeed on the battlefield. And that's true, mind you, whether it's coming from the government or the private sector. And as such, we have a shared role and re responsibility in delivering that combat power and readiness. So if I'm right, the, the, the topic is relevant to anyone who wants our leaner army, not smaller army, leaner army to stay capable, whether they are inside this room or not. Uh, the challenge will be, of course, capturing the attention of those uh, who might not be in the room. And this isn't uh, just a theoretical construct, by the way. We've got uh, units uh, in harm's way as we speak. We have units being deployed who need every ounce of combat readiness and combat power that our uh, industrial base is able to produce. So simply said, our industrial base is a, is a national asset. In fact, we, we in AMC describe our organic industrial base as a national treasure, not an Army treasure, not an AMC treasure, a national treasure. And regardless of the, the budget conditions, regardless of world threats as they come and go, regardless of uh, economic conditions or budgetary decisions or, or conditions, we need a viable industrial base and a science and technology base to go along with it to meet DOD's equipment needs and be responsive to the next operational requirement. And when none of us ought to be naive. There will be another operational requirement. We just don't know when. So I think everyone pretty much gets the fact that we are in a period of transition. Uh, we're transitioning from a period of, of lengthy uh, wartime requirements to a period of sustainment. But we're doing that, as General Sullivan said early on, we're doing that without seeing a corollary reduction in world threats across, across, across the globe and without uh, necessarily improved prospects for peace as well. And that's why this discussion that we're about to have here with my panelists is, uh, is so important. Uh, but before going any further, I do want to acknowledge and say how immensely grateful that, that AMC and the Army are for what industry brings to this shared industrial partnership that we have. In the last 12 years is, is eminent proof that we do this real, real well. Um, and appreciate how our industry partners are motivated just as we are in the government side for supporting and serving our country, supporting our soldiers, and we don't take that partnership for granted. And we're proud to have uh, industry partners as our partners. Now, I know the, the title of this particular panel discussion is Operating in the New Mor Normal, but this presupposes that there is such a thing as normal. 
or that we have confidence in being able to define what, what normal is. It may more be about understanding the, the newer, more recent conditions we are facing and adapting to change rather than trying to define or meet somebody's expectation for normalcy, what, whatever that may be. So what are these conditions? And I'm going to describe them uh, just very briefly from the, the Army foxhole that I sit in. But I, I would say that these are uh, applicable to uh, the entire industrial base. Uh, beginning, first of all, preeminently, our budget is our declining. Uh, that is not a new phenomenon, although it's been a while since we've seen that, uh, since the 90s. And it's, and it's not just a adjustment or a number on a ledger sheet. We're seeing manifestations of those, those budget reductions on our industrial base. For example, the gap in Abrams tank reduction at our Joint Services Manufacturing Center uh, combat vehicle workload is less than core levels at Army, uh, Aniston uh, Army Depot here in Alabama and Red River Army Depot in Texas. Um, we're seeing minimal workload scheduled at some of our arsenals and ammunition plants across the country as well. Secondly, in the meantime, our infrastructure is continuing to age and showing signs of that age, and it's in need of continued modernization and investment because this is a a, um, an infrastructure that was born, for the most part, in World War II uh, a few years back. Uh, third, we are seeing in the government side certainly some excess capacity. And there is no BRAC process uh, at the moment. Uh, there may be at some point. But in the meantime, it's leading us to, do, to make tough decisions about perhaps inactivating, do, doing what we can to to rationalize and right-size our infrastructure in the Army. Um, fourth, there are single points of failure, and they are in our production base, and they're also in our, our supply chain that are present. And those vulnerabilities may become more acute uh, under the conditions that we're facing. For example, Radford Army Ammunition Plant in southwestern Virginia, it's the only domestic source of nitrocellulose, and that's a key element in joint service weapons. Um, uh, fifth, the dependencies on foreign suppliers have been increasing over time, and they're continuing to increase uh, as well. And then lastly, in the Army, our, uh, our depot, our, our, our maintenance, depot maintenance workload measured in uh, direct labor hours roughly is roughly one half of the peak we saw in uh, 2008, uh, still above pre-war levels for now. So what, what actions are we taking in AMC? Well, we're continuing to make, uh, trying to make uh, smart capital improvements in our product lines and also in the quality of the work environment for our, our uh, artisans in our depots. We're trying to rationalize and align our infrastructure capacity. We're reducing overhead costs to, to stay competitive and viable just as industry is. We're focusing our, on our critical capabilities and our core competencies and maintaining the skilled workforce, even if that workforce is less than what it has been, and it, always in seeking of trying to provide a predictable workload. We're looking to try and increase revenue at our, at our centers through foreign military sales, through work with our joint partners. We're trying to maintain our centers for, for uh, industrial and technical excellence that we establish for specific business lines at our depots and arsenals. We're establishing, or in many cases, strengthening and continuing the complementary capabilities uh, between public and private sector, our, our so-called P3, our public-private partnerships, um, and so on. I guess in closing, uh, for me to wrap up, I, I would say that probably many in this room, at least, uh, get it already. So, you know, we have to ask, uh, are we just talking to ourselves? Uh, should others care enough besides those of us who have some vested interest in what the industrial base is doing and capable of doing in pro providing readiness for our, our joint war fight, uh, for fighting forces? I'd say that those of us who understand the significance of the, the industrial base in terms of what it provides and combat power and readiness have a, have a uh, significant responsibility in sharing that understanding to those who don't. And that means all of us have a role in that department, not just those in AMC, not just those in the Army, but all of us here, here today. 
So in the meantime, I would advise all of us to keep an eye on the future, uh, keep an eye on its signals, uh, be prepared to adapt. The new normal may not be normal for long. Uh, government and industry need to work hard, in fact, work harder to understand each other and then work together on the common challenges uh, and conditions that we face. And we have to learn and understand the political and national budget realities that remain for us a very real dimension that we, in particular in the Army and, and in industry, sometimes underestimate or do not fully appreciate. And we'll hear more about that here in a moment as well. So thanks for your attention. Uh, I'd like to turn it over to uh, the, the, the senior logistician for the headquarters department of the Army, General Ray Mason, the G4. Well, good morning. And uh, yeah, I'm Ray Mason, the Army G4. I've been uh, doing that for almost three years. I've got a magnificent team, many of which are in the audience today. So when we get to the questions and answers, uh, I'll call a friend if I need a little help. I got plenty of them. Um, I want to thank AUSA and General Sullivan. Uh, I've been a member of AUSA for 35 years, which is about six months longer than I've been married. Uh, it's been a great marriage, though. So a distinguished panel and uh, proud, to, proud to be here. Uh, I'm just going to cover kind of two major themes. One is an Army focus based on the Chief's priorities. If you go to the next slide, you'll see the Chief's priorities there in a the box on the right, and I'll just briefly hit the highlights of those. I know the Chief's going to speak on Friday and close out this, this symposium. But the second theme is the Organic Industrial Base Strategic Plan, which we've got magnificent partners with. Of course, we've got DA, which is the seat of all knowledge, as everybody knows. But we get great partners at AMC. General Vi laid that out very well uh, this past half hour. Pat McQuishan sitting down front, great teammate. John Nerger across the board. Chris Lohman, who's my director of maintenance, is really in many ways the author behind this. Uh, he's not going to get any more pay, but he did a great job on that work. Uh, also, Wimpy Pibus, who I think is in the audience, who's uh, from ASALT. He's the log lead there, and it's been a, in a great partnership. And then finally, I'd mention Vicki Plunkett and the great staffers in the HAS that help us kind of work this through the Congress. So it's been a great, great team effort. Uh, i got four pretty quick slides I'll go through. Uh, but I'd start off and in, in quote General Shinseki, a former Chief of Staff of the Army, current uh, Director of the Veterans Administration. And he used to say that what leaders do, the real value they add to an organization is managing transitions. We're always in some kind of transition. There's no question about it. And certainly at this moment in time, it is a significant transition coming out of 12 years of combat. Uh, we could almost call this soon to be perhaps the inner war years, although we've still got men and women in harm's way this very day, as we well know. And then as whatever we prepare for the next thing. And that's why the Army's organic and industrial-based strategic plan is so critical. It's part of us managing this transition. So if you look at the Chief's priorities, I'd highlight a couple things in there that are specifically focused and in, in important to the logisticians. Responsive and regionally engaged Army. That means being able to get out of whatever your post camp and station in the right way, get to the fight as soon as you can, be an agile, adaptable, and so on and so forth. And we talk a little bit more about that. The last piece of the Chief's uh, priorities that, it, that I think in many ways is a centerpiece is to maintain the premier all-volunteer force. An all-volunteer force is not inexpensive. Uh, it's got requirements in it for pay and compensation and medical and things of that nature. But if you, if you go back and read some of the pundits at the end of the Vietnam War as we came out of that war, my dad fought there three times. Many of you probably served there. Um, the pundits at the time said if the, na if the U.S. military ever got into protracted conflict again, and most of them defined protracted conflict as six months or longer, we would have to go back to the draft. We could not survive in combat. Well, we've been at 12 years of combat. I mean, that is an incredible statement in, the, in our citizens stepping up to the plate. And most of our soldiers, you know, have, have joined since 9-11, knowing full well they, have, they would have to go into combat. I mean, I think it speaks volumes about the nation that we are, this young democracy. But we can't take it for granted, and that's why the work that AUSA does, I think, is particularly important in being the voice for the soldier. Uh, let me just hit a couple bullets here on the Army focus. First is we, we spend a significant amount of time working with our partners in theater on retrograde. We've got to get that equipment out of there, and we've been actually doing that pretty, pretty well, because it's our most modern, most recent up-armored systems vehicles, command and control, biometrics, on and on. Some of the stuff you just saw that General Vi brought up there. We've got to get that equipment out for whatever the next fight is. So to do that, in about 2013, February time frame, we had about $27 billion worth of Army gear in Afghanistan. Today, we've got about $16 billion. Now, that $16 billion, we're going to bring home about $10 billion. So that means about $6 billion or so 
we're going to divest, we're going to sell, uh, and some of it, in fact, we'll scrap. To reset that, we need $9.5 billion. So that's an investment to get $21 billion worth of equipment that we've already retrograded either from Iraq, sitting at the depots now, or will come out of Afghanistan. It's an investment in $9.5 billion. To transport it back is a window between $1 to $3 billion. I'm saying this mostly for Vicki Plunkett, who's sitting down there. She writes this down and gives us the dollars. Uh, the window of $1 to $3 billion is really based on the variability of things that are happening, the pack g lock, enemy activity, uh, the price of fuel, a variety of different things from best case to worst case. So really, for an investment we think of about $11 billion, you're going to get a return of $21 billion worth of equipment. Pretty good return on your investment. And so that's the message we've been sending to Congress. And the work that the, uh, the, the, the Log Nation is doing in theater is pretty remarkable. Buyback readiness. The, the Budget Control Act, sequestration, and oh, by the way, you know, we're only in the second year of a 10-year sequestration. I mean, some people don't realize that. This thing is going to continue on unless, you know, we come up with a solution set. So these sequestration issues continue on. Many of you probably watched the service chiefs testify not too long ago on the Hill. And to a person, every one of them talked about readiness in this trough we're in right now. The chief staff of the Army talked at that time we only had two brigade combat teams that was C-1, our most ready level. Now, a lot of our units are assigned mission ready, but they're not ready for full spectrum missions. And that's part of the balance we're getting back to. So trying to buy that readiness back. The funding we got in the, in the uh, budget for 14 is helping a lot. But it's going to take us a number of years to recover from all the, uh, the downside of the d dollars that we didn't get. Uh, General Vi mentioned the rebalance of the Pacific, working a set the theater kind of piece. What's the infrastructure logistically? What are the airfields, the seaports, the ammunition nodes? All those pieces uh, that we need to have in place uh, to conduct operations in the Pacific. That could be humanitarian aid all the way up to full spectrum combat. I'll tell you what keeps me up at night as a logistician uh, is anti access area denial. If you're a potential foe of the United States, you've been watching us since Desert Storm, and what do you want to prevent the United States from doing? Building up for six months in sanctuary and then going across the berm. We did that in Desert Storm. We did it in OIF. We did it to a certain extent in OEF, a little bit different in Afghanistan. So anti-access, keep us from doing that. So there's a whole series of pieces we're working. We need industry's help to try to figure out how do we overfly airfields, how do we not come with this big, huge although mass is important, as General Sullivan said, but how do we package ourselves right, combat configured loads, Army prepositioned sets, air, sea lift. In fact, we're going to have an AUSA symposium in June uh, that the G4 will host with AUSA that's going to focus primarily on strategic mobility and all that entails across the Joint Force. There's a lot of pent-up demand in the COCOMs. You know, Mother CENTCOM's been, been kind of the centerpiece for many years. PACOM's got a lot of activity they want to do, SOUTHCOM, NORTHCOM. So this regionally aligned forces, RAF, that you've heard about, is aligning all the elements, all the units in the Army against different COCOMs, and they can focus in on those war plans, the language, the culture, all those kinds of things and become immersed in it. I'm sure the Chief will talk a little bit more about that. Decisive action. We've lost some of our skill sets and have atrophied in some of the full spectrum of conflict. We became very, very good at COIN operations, counterinsurgency, training operations, but there was a set of combat that really since OIF-1 and OEF-1, we, we did less and less and less. So we're trying to gain that back. Things like command and control on the move, not going into a FOB and plugging in, not being FOB-centric, being able to do maneuver and fire, uh, echeloning capability, echeloning logistics. How about, you know, when I go to the pre-command course, I ask them, how many people know what a ROM is? A few hands go up. How many have done a ROM in the last 10 years? Almost none of them. Refuel on the move. Not that complicated a battle drill, but it was part of our, part of our DNA as an Army uh, in when we had airland battle. We've got to get those skill sets back, and the leaders are getting after it. Last comment on this is the drawdown of the force. And so, as you know, we've got three kind of rheostats. We've got people we can turn, or structure. We've got readiness and modernization. We certainly worked the readiness accounts. That's where the most fungible dollars were we, we could go to quickly. We're bringing the force down, uh, down to 490 for the active by FY15, uh, and trying to balance all those pieces. We certainly want to invest appropriately in modernization for the insurance policy of the future. And then that compensation is the newest kind of piece that kind of messes that triangle up. Where's compensation at? Pay, medical, retirement, all those things are on the table and working our way through that. So those are the focus pieces and the umbrella of which we've got to work in the future. Next slide. 
Okay. Uh, I'll just again hit the highlights here. The, uh, we do a, a governance of the organic industrial base, and it's all about um, balance between the organic base and the commercial base. And we certainly, through public-private partnerships, a variety of different things. Pat McQuistian, myself, and Bill Phillips are the tri-chairs of the OIB. And again, we're always looking as work comes in, where is the right place to put that work? What should we do organically? What should we push to the commercial business? What can they do comparatively advantage better than we can? So we conducted a pretty in-depth study, as it shows in the second bullet there. Uh, what are the arsenal capabilities we want to have, the critical manufacturing capability? If there's a skill set that exists in the commercial world, and it's going to be solvent and, and solid, and it's not going to be either go offshore and we know we can count on it, we probably don't need to do that in our arsenals. That can be done by the commercial sector. So it's, a, it's really a risk assessment of where we're at on that. We're also focusing very much on our quality of work for our workforce, and they've taken a tough year with the furlough and things of this last year, so I know General Bai and Pat are working that hard. Uh, we're working very closely with the other services, working some things that we do for the, uh, for the Navy, Air Force, Marines, and so forth, and uh, our great partners at DLA. Uh, they're sending us work of, of back orders that they're not able to get out in the commercial world, and we're working those. So again, trying to, to be as efficient as we can. Um, I've got two other slides, but I'm only going to hit a couple key points. Next slide. So the, so the public-private partnerships is key to this piece. And what we did is every new system the Army develops, we go through a process called depot source of repair determination. What are we going to do organically? What can we go out? We're trying to get ourselves back in balance with contractor logistics support. I, I am, you know, I, I've spent my whole career with contractors on the battlefield. They're going to be there in the future. They were there at Valley Forge. I got it. But there's this balance, and I think perhaps we went a little bit too far in our contractor logistics support. We're trying to get that back into plumb again. You'll probably see more on that. Um, Ms. Shu has, has initiated a thing called the LIRA. You see it on the bottom there, long-range investment requirements analysis. Kind of surprised me when I got to the DA. We didn't really have a system to look deep 20, 30 years in, the, in what the cost of a system was. As you know, 70 to 80 percent of the cost is in that life cycle. It's in that tail. So we've got a pretty good process to do that. We can talk about it more in Q&A. And then last slide. So FY11 was our high point for the organic industrial base in terms of workload. We are going down. We knew we were going to come down. So we're trying to bring the resources, the people, the structure, uh, all the capabilities uh, down an appropriate level to the workload that's required based on the COCOM war plans and the force structure. And we're right-sizing that. Sometimes we can't shed, you know, certain capabilities as quickly as we, we would perhaps in the commercial world. And we're working with Congress on that. So we're looking through. That's what the OIB is all about. Uh, and we've got the processes to do that. So I look forward to your Q&As, and thank you very much. Chris. Sure. I guess they're already on. Hey, good morning, uh, Colonel Chris Carlisle. I'm former commander of uh, Corpus Christi Army Depot, and wanted to share with you a few of the depot commander's perspectives from, from the industrial and organic industrial base. Uh, slide, please. The first slide here, I've got a few points that uh, uh, could easily be expounded on for a good deal of time, but I'll make sure I'll stay within uh, the allotted time. The importance of strategic business planning, and this is something that I found in, in going with industry and looking at best business practices, I think all of you would agree it's the thing that uh, in industry is, has as the hardest thing to do. And it's the one thing that is the first thing to fall off the table. But it's important to be uh, imprecisely right uh, better than being precisely wrong as we go forward and as uh, as I've said many times to the folks that that I've worked with over the last uh, few years it's the hardest thing but it's also never too late it just means that the correction is going to be a lot more painful and so most of us in the room and many of us are behind the power curve to a degree because of the new norm and uh, with that, I would just leave that from a depot commander's perspective, it is important. And now that we have the Army's organic industrial base strategic plan, that gives us a great framework by which the depot commanders and AMC has the ability to uh, manage that organic industrial base and leverage it with industry. The second point that I'd like to make is uh, the importance of human capital investment uh, at the investment strategy we can't afford to go back to the 90s where we had a hiring freeze of about 10 years because the experience level that that formed caused a gap for those of us that had to support and in my case supporting the great uh, 
rot uh, joint rotary wing assets that provide, especially Army assets, that provide lethality, flexibility, and agility on the battlefield. You had a group of folks who were artisan level and about 10 to 15 years between the next upstarts. I think in the future it's going to be imperative that we build a bench, we find a way to build that bench and maintain it, and maybe manage it somewhat like the <coughs> Army manages its officers and NCOs in a cohort style, maybe multi-year multi uh, management, three to five years or something like that. But it's going to be important because uh, we, we felt that growing pain over the last uh, 10 to 13 years of, of supporting the huge requirements that were put upon our arsenals and depots. The importance of public-private partnerships, and I'm sure you're going to hear this many, many times. You've heard it from the other two speakers before me. But from an investment strategy, I think that you have to look at, the, at it. We have already sunk cost into maintaining a national treasure and a strategic advantage for this country. And the way to go about making business work for supporting the soldier and the joint warfighter, I think, comes best for you to find ways to partner with the depot, use their capital, use what we've already paid for, use their capacity, which we've already paid for, and then use that and your, uh, you know, your proprietary information, te technical data, and expertise. And in many cases, we can perform much, much better for our warfighters and provide it at a much lower cost. And I think that in itself, it's, uh, I, I remember back as the Unmanned Aircraft Systems Director, uh, Center of Excellence Director back in 2009. I had a man tell me one time he didn't need a robot to mow his yard. He had a 17-year-old son. Well, th that may be true, and it's much the same with our arsenals and depots. We have them because they are there when we need them the most. And uh, there are many, many opportunities for you, and I would encourage each and every one of you in business to reach out to the arsenals and depots and uh, and if I can help you in any way, let me know. Importance of reducing overhead and GNA. We all know, those of you that are industry in the room, if you go to an ERP, and AMC went into, under an ERP called LMP uh, about, uh, I guess we began it about 10 years ago, 10, 11 years ago, but we're now really starting to uh, embrace and get to what that allows you to do. I, liked, I used to say that it gives you transparency and visibility. Once we get to the next increment, which is shop floor automation, it'll give you visibility and transparency from the shop floor to the sixth floor. And that is what you have to have to run a business as big as the business that AMC is running. Uh, I think that we have to remember that automation is a tool but automation and its ability is a culture. And just as you found in business, uh, much like uh, getting word processing software, we had secretarial pools for another 10 years after we got word processing. So that in itself is going to be, I think, the biggest game changer in our business in the next three to five years is uh, shop floor automation and the ability to track work in progress and be able to see every cost associated with an item. The last thing on this chart is the imperativeness of optimizing, not suboptimizing, due to local interests. And this is a hard thing for, for folks, especially with a culture change. As we go forward, we have to ensure that we place work where it needs to be, where it is with the center of industrial and technical excellence, which has um, been cited by the uh, Department of the Army, and also the core workload levels that uh, Mr. Lohman and his staff work with AMC to ensure that we maintain those artisan level tasks that you do not <coughs> regain in short period, just like General Mason discussed. You know, technology is a two-edged uh, sword. As it becomes more and more uh, rampant and more and more available, it also drives costs down, which causes, in some cases, duplicity in our capacity and capabilities. And so in some cases, unfortunately, it makes our depots more capable, but at the same time can make them a competitor with a, the arsenal that we depend upon for our heavy lifting uh, in manufacturing. The last uh, thing there I'd like to just hit on is the, you know, maximizing uh, the in organic industrial base to ensure that we can continue to maintain those national treasures. I truly believe Having uh, been out there and, and worked it hard, 
uh, from Corpus Christi and work with great industry partners, I, I know for a fact that we're just scratching the surface on what can be done. Uh, next slide, please. And this is my last slide, but I would like to just, this slide, if this was, uh, I see General Mangum down on the second row there, and as an aviator, I tried to figure out a way to put little flip switches, you know, so you couldn't, you could lock out switches here. But the intent is, is to show that just as in, my little keyword up here is business decisions in the organic industrial base have a half-life all their own. I like to say sometimes it feels like it's uranium because unlike the business of private industry, some of the decisions that we make, we have hard time because of regulations, law, this and that, from being able to enact what we need to do so it makes it even that much more imperative to ensure the health of the organic industrial base to follow those tenets that have been kind of laid out before. You know, transparency, again, is what it's going to take. And if you look up there, you see just a few of them. And, and many of these are absolutely impossible, if not near impossible. One of those is BRAC. Uh, you can't BRAC without legislation and without law, so you can go ahead and take that one, and that would be a locked out switch. And then when it comes to right sizing the workforce, you know, because of RIF packages and the like, it doesn't happen overnight. It's actually a long term process. So those are some of the things that I think that are on the depot and arsenal commander's minds today, and I uh, hope you have some questions. Thank you. Kevin? Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, it's an uh, honor to be on this uh, uh, panel. Uh, you know, I was sort of surprised as my two bosses left the room when I came up here. I don't know what that means, right? And so, I mean, most of you know me. I've been a PEO for quite a while, so in a lot of instances, I feel like Forrest Gump of uh, PEOs, and so I'm uh, happy to be here in the great state of Alabama. Uh, so uh, my portfolio uh, today covers uh, uh, basically all things sustainment uh, with CASCOM and uh, most of the things from the engineering school with the exception of the uh, explosives. You know, I have uh, uh, mobile electric power, which is all the generators, uh, power distribution, air conditioning, heating, all those kind of things. Uh, I have uh, uh, the Army's MRAPs and had a big role in MRAP in general. I have all the transportation systems, which is trucks and boats. A lot of people forget that the Army still has quite a few uh, boats that will be critical for the uh, Pacific. Uh, joint light tactical uh, uh, vehicle. And then I have this thing called force projection, which is everything but the kitchen sink. Actually, it includes the kitchen sink, right? It's uh, bridges, you know, water petroleum, uh, you know, material handling, construction equipment, uh, all things on the base, including toilets and all those kind of things. And, so sometimes when my boss gets mad at me, I say, what are you going to do, send me to Detroit and put me in charge of toilets? Uh, you know, I'm already there. Um, you know, just a little bit of a background. So I was an AMC intern. I don't like to admit that very often, but I, but I am an AMC intern. I started my career at an organic facility, right? So I started my career at Waterville Eat Arsenal. Uh, I basically have a background in three portfolios, uh, uh, ammunition. I was PEO ground combat systems, now I'm combat support, combat service support. So the only depot I've never dealt with is Corpus Christi. Every other one I've actually uh, been at, uh, which uh, a lot of people can't say that they've uh, been at every uh, uh, facility. You know, so, um, you know, uh, most of you know is uh, we do have a partnership with uh, uh, AMC. Uh, my battle buddy is TACOM Lifecycle Management Command. I know Major General Terry is here. And so he relies on me to a large extent to be the life cycle manager of the equipment uh, that falls within my portfolio. So, I mean, a lot of the things that I worry about internal to the government is the same things I, I worry about external to the government, right? So it's maintaining acquisition excellence uh, and uh, this challenging budgetary and, uh, you know, uncertainty uh, uh, times. And then if you look at it, I mean, some people forget uh, sustaining the stuff we have is going to be really hard and to a large extent we're still learning what, well we will be learning for many years to come what that means because how we sustain it in war isn't necessarily how we'll sustain it afterwards. And then we'll have a large uh, responsibility of continuing to develop and modernize and field additional equipment. So when you look at my two highest uh, priorities and two biggest headaches, it's the people part of it, right? And it's the people part of it from a government perspective. I mean, if you look at from a government, after 12 years of war, in a lot of instances, we've just rebuilt a core competency that we sort of deteriorated in the 90s. 
And so if you look at it, and the one I'll use because it's probably the best example in the procurement acquisition arena, uh, we finally got to the point where I think we had uh, rebuilt it, but a lot of people don't understand uh, a large percentage, somewhere in the order of 50% of that workforce is like five years or less experience. And to a large extent, the only thing they know is operating in war. Uh, and uh, operating in uh, uh, peacetime is not necessarily the same as operating in war. So in a lot of instances, what I would tell you, we learned the right habits, uh, but they weren't necessarily good habits, right? So our priority was to field things quickly and all those kind of things. We, uh, as you know, we had a lot of undefinitized contract actions and all those kind of things that when we get back into the norm, uh, we're already talking about downsizing the civilian workforce to go with the military workforce and it scares the living crap out of me, both internal to the government, and then if you look at what I would tell you is industry's probably uh, better at it, better at it necessarily being uh, they're quicker at it because they have to be, um, so they can help us learn how we did that. What I would tell you in a lot of instances, how they do that, uh, we have to react to it because uh, they make business decisions and based on those business decisions, uh, sometimes, you know, we have to uh, take action because we didn't expect somebody to go out of that part of the industry, right? And so you, you think of those kind of things. Uh, you know, as uh, we talk, you know, I mean, a lot of what you think about is when we say, what's the new norm, right? And I, I probably get the question more than any other is, what was it like before the war? You should just go back there. It's not the same, right? You think about it. In every instance, whether it be an organic facility or commercial facility, we went from producing whatever it is, say 10 a day to 100 a day. Well, the infrastructure that we built to do what we did during war, you don't just go like that and you're back to the infrastructure you got. Not only is there a lot of overhead capacity, but in most instances, there's tremendous additional capability that exists both in commercial and organic that just does not go away when you go back to building 10 trucks a day versus 100 trucks a day. It's not as simple as most people will say. And, and I'll tell you, I remember getting the crap beat out of me of I'm not ramping up hard enough. Even when we were doing that, I was more worried about today than I was worried about whether I was gonna deliver an MRAP to the field because I knew us in industry would get that done, right? I mean, I would tell you, uh, it was amazing what we collectively had done, but even at that time, I was worried about today uh, because we don't do that very well. Um, and so, you know, I would tell you, we do a lot of the uh, right things. We do have a lot of the right relationships in my portfolio is I have what we call board of directors. Uh, in fact, uh, yesterday morning, I had one here with the ordinance commandant. Last week, I had one at CASCOM with General Weiss uh, that had all his commanders. And we start with that of the priorities, the trade arc priorities and capability gaps and what we all should be focused on. And it includes all the stakeholders, right? It's the entire Army staff. Uh, and the portfolio I have is a huge part of it is Army National Guard and Reserve. Uh, uh, we do have uh, other services to a large extent. That's the Marine Corps, because the Marine Corps basically buys most of the stuff uh, we do. AMC is a huge player, both in the S&T sustainment. No, oh, by the way, almost everybody that supports our programs every day is matrix support from AMC. And then obviously, what we do and how we prioritize communicating that and coordinating that with Congress is always a big deal, right? And so you go through, one of the things that's gonna be challenging is in a lot of instances, our fixed overhead is something that with internal to the government, we don't necessarily understand, right? I mean, obviously industry understands that because it's all about how do you account for that? And so we're struggling now with, you know, I'll give you a good example. To a large extent, the government, rightfully so, views S&T, as a fixed overhead, right? Because our thinking is we gotta to continue to fund that S&T to continue to be able to develop those capabilities uh, today and in tomorrow. And so we have some of those things that we're still trying to uh, sort through of, of even though the programs come down, what are the fixed costs of doing our internal uh, acquisition? And you know some of the challenges we have, right? Is what is gonna be the size of our force? And that is gonna be directly related, what is the equipment required for that size of the force? And then uh, what are our future capabilities as we go forward, because we, we do have to continue to modernize. And then as we go through it, we're gonna be downsizing, industry's downsizing, and on both sides, I worry about the morale and how sharp we stay to be able to deliver the things we have. 
So, you know, uh, as we talked, uh, as the Colonel talked, is one of our critical challenges in the Army, we tend to be tactically very good. We need to really think strategically, right? So if you think about all the things that you heard about, about uh, better buying power, what I would tell you, all, the only thing that means to me, uh, and I think, I think Mr. Kendall and Ms. Shue would uh, agree with me, and I'm so sort of glad, is, is we need to uh, do the right analysis and think strategically, right? Because the decisions we make, the decisions we make on acquisition is going to ultimately decide what happens to the industrial base, right? And so it, it's one of those things we need to think strategically and understand the right analysis and the details. And, and I'll tell you, we struggle. What are the, you know, both in organically and commercial, what are the right skills, capabilities, and functions that are most critical to our warfighter? And I'll tell you, one of the things that we struggle with a lot is, is large companies or even small companies don't, stay, don't have their engineers stay around to support us if our tank breaks down in theater. For the most part, they maintain that core competency because they're in the business of delivering tanks, right? So what kind of workload do you need to have in the industry to maintain what we consider those critical capabilities is something we struggle with all, all the time. Uh, I think uh, the other thing is what I would tell you from where I sit, uh, we were lucky with this war right, is the situation in the industrial base and the economy was perfect for us, right? So how responsive industry was, you know, both in small and large industry was because uh, at that time the economy was basically going down. So we, the industry was amazingly responsive. I mean, you look at anything we've had, I'm real nervous that five, ten years from now, we, won't, we may not be in the same situation if we face another war of our ability to have a very responsive industry to the things we need. And as you know, the questions we get when we go to war, uh, what can you do for me in, the, in a less than a year, right? And we get asked that question every year, right? And so like five years into the war, if you asked me what I could do in five years, I would have given you a different answer, right? And so we're always about what can you do for me now? So that's a, always a, a, a big challenge. So um, I think our biggest challenge is what is the new norm, right? I think you heard it here. Um, I, I think depending on where you sit, uh, it looks a little different, right? And so that's one of those things. Uh, I, you know, the, the good news is, is our focus is always going to be the same, right? Our focus is always at the soldier and the joint warfighter and how do we sustain them and how do we give them the right capabilities. I do believe as we go forward, uh, joint is going to be critical because, uh, uh, you know, we got the joint light tactical vehicle. I will tell you today, we're already starting working with CASCOM and working with the Marine Corps is what's the next joint medium and heavy truck, right? We, we probably won't buy it for 15 years, but we need to start the S&T today. So we're already looking at those kind of things. I think uh, uh, one of the things industry worries about it, we worry about it, what is the government's overhead? Right? And how do we reduce that overhead in the right places and really understand that? Uh, and I think innovation and uh, being adaptive is something we all got to figure out. And how do you maintain the, the innovation and in industry as we go forward? And uh, I tell you the most critical things is we're in this all together, right? And so the most important thing is that we continue to share uh, our uh, situations because I'll tell you, I, I feel like I'm always in an if-then situation. If this happens, then what do we, the government, have to do to account for that? Because everything's a risk mitigation strategy. So I would leave you with that. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Vicki Plunkett. I'm the minority staff lead for the Readiness Subcommittee of the House Armed Services Committee. But more importantly, I am a graduate of Enterprise High School in Lower Alabama and a graduate of Auburn University. <laughs> So first, I'm required to say that the opinions expressed here today are mine and not those of the House Armed Services Committee. Um, four structure, so speaking of the mass that uh, General Sullivan talked about, four structure changes brought about by the declining budgets and the projected end of the war in Afghanistan will be the 800-pound gorilla in the room during this year's consideration of the FY15 defense budget and the FY15 National Defense Authorization Act. More specifically, the already acrimonious debate over the breakout of active and Army Guard in strength and force structure will suck all of the oxygen out of the room, leaving very little energy or meaningful debate for meaningful debate on other significant issues, including the headquarters reductions ordered by Defense Secretary Hagel or the ever-growing cost of personnel compensation and benefits. 
These four structured decisions should drive the future requirements that will be the context in which workload decisions for the Army's depots and arsenals, the Navy shipyards, the Air Force's logistics center complexes are made. Force structure, of course, will inform what equipment is retrograded, reset, and recapitalized, and subsequently how many people are needed to maintain it, and budgets will decide at what standard it is maintained. We've already seen what happened when the Navy floated the trial balloon of permanently reducing the number of active aircraft carriers to 10. And on Monday, the Pentagon purposefully leaked a potential reduction in the FY15 purchase of Joint Strike Fighters from 42 to 34. To 34. For the Army, the argument apparently will center on what, the top, what type of aviation force structure can afford and where, which of course has implications for how and where the Army will maintain and sustain that force structure. So the bottom line is support what? And General Sullivan, I think you're right. We don't need another commission to figure it out, but my guess is we'll get one. Next slide. So if active reserve force structure is the 800-pound gorilla, the need to address entitlements, also known as mandatory spending, is in the larger federal budget is the King Kong on whose back the DOD budget sits in context. If the pressures of mandatory spending are not addressed, the share of existing revenues that can be allocated to discretionary spending, as shown in the next slide, please, will get smaller and smaller. Within the slice of discretionary spending, defense or national security is the largest portion as shown in the next slide, please. And CBO predicts that that could reach 742 billion by, tw by 2024. So, when looking at this graphic, keep in mind that national security can involve more than just the military which is obviously the gorilla sitting on back of the larger gorilla that we saw before. An effective military needs healthy and educated recruits. It needs highway, IT, and energy infrastructure throughout the nation. It needs trained scientists for research and development and skilled artisans to maintain and sustain its facilities and equipment. It needs a robust business and agricultural system to provide the business, to provide the equipment, goods, and services which support and sustain it. These, however, are the national priority decisions that cause the nation and the Congress to divide into the factions within factions that cause us to lurch from continuing resolution to continuing resolution, which is the most expensive way of doing government, and from addressing, addressing the national debt except in crisis mode, and to resorting to concepts like sequestration, which basically abandons the concept of priority. Next slide. So what happens when, as this chart shows, from the, uh, from the Congressional Budget Office predicts, spending continues to outstretch revenues, as in shown in, on top, because, as shown at the bottom, spending on interest, spending on your mama's Social Security and my mama's Medicare, continue to rise while other non-interest spending, including defense, falls, because this is what happens under sequestration since it did nothing to address mandatory spending. And we've extended sequester for another year as the fix for the um, retirees' COLA that um, was so um, politically addressed in the last week. So, next slide. So, what's the answer? Well, presently, the answer is this, as you see on the cartoon. And this year's congressional elections are looking like they're going to bring us more of the same. In spite of these polit political and budgetary obstacles that appear to be either from the inside or from the, where I sit or from the outside, appear to be insurmountable, we, the Pentagon, the Congress, and industry, need to be undertaking serious debate and consideration of the following. In light of declining requirements, do we still need a statutory 6% minimum capital investment in our depots and arsenals? Without it, however, how do we ensure they remain first-class facilities? How much emphasis should be given to public-private partnerships, which are not a panacea for lack of workload? What are the goals of these partnerships? How do we measure their value to the Army? And what metrics should we use to assess their effectiveness? 
Should the arsenals remain within work, within, remain working capital funded, or should we consider another funding cons concept like the Navy did for its organic shipyards? How do we get past the characterization of them as national treasures, which can become meaningless in the face of below, below core funding and workload? Can we ever have a rational discussion on whether these organic manufacturing capabilities truly are critical? And what is the risk to national security of not having them? What is the true, real risk? Are we talking about that? What organic industrial capability is needed once the end strength and force structure decisions have been made? And will we address them reasonably through another round of base closure? Or will the depots and arsenals be subjected to death by a thousand cuts through <coughs> below threshold reductions in force and loss of workload? And I would say that um, actually we do have standing statutory BRAC authority. It is in Title 10 in, in um, I can't remember whether it's Section 2687 or 2867, but it does, it does give the services authority to, make, to do closures. It only requires notification to Congress. It doesn't say that Congress uh, will stop, immediately stop them because um, it gives, it's a notification with time for Congress to act. The Army also, the Secretary of the Army also has unilateral authority, standing statutory Title X authority to close arsenals, unilateral. Now, the issue is, um, would the services, would DOD, would the services take advantage of those statutory authorities and use them? I will point this out to you. Um, Congress is basically um, dysfunctional right now. The authorities only require notification. Um, take your chances, or, you know, because it's going to require, <laughs> it's going to require us to get our act together to stop it. So. I can't wait till I testify next. That's yeah. really going to be a great time. <laughs> Remember, these are my opinions, not the opinions, not the position of the committee. So uh, another issue, how do we quickly move sustainment of non-program of record equipment fielded through the rapid equipment force into the depots? Can organic industrial facilities be efficient and effective if their workforces are maintained only at levels necessary to meet core and minimal sustainment levels? And what are the political repercussions of doing so, or should we even care about the political repercussions? And finally, what is the level and type of ready and controlled organic capability that should be retained to ensure we have the capability to ramp up in a timely manner for contingencies and war? I will close by quoting my um, ranking member, Adam Smith of Washington. If the, if the Congress and the nation cannot address these things, in, in, especially in the context of the 15 budget, and if we keep pushing those hard decisions down the road and don't really make them or make them and walk away from them within a month, Mr. Smith said his greatest fear is that refusal to compromise on weapons programs, force size, pay, or benefits will force the military to cut training, ammunition, and other readiness funds, and that politicians will be able to ignore the consequences until troops end up in combat unprepared and people die. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Vicki. So to, to my uh, fellow industry counterparts down there, uh, Mark and Mike, uh, as typical, you know, the, the, uh, we have seven minutes left, and uh, is it done? <laughs> so uh, ready for I mean, fielding, you're right? You're squeezing us from both ends. Like so, uh, <laughs> I, I don't think there's anything new about this. <laughs> so, so I'll go quick. I'm Mark Signorelli. Uh, I'm the uh, Combat Vehicles and Tactical Wheeled Vehicle Portfolio Manager for VA Systems Land and Armaments. Um, so the first thing I thought about is, is thinking about the title of this was, you know, uh, operating in a new normal. Uh, I had a hard time defining what the old normal was uh, as over the last 17 years in industry. Uh, while funding may have been somewhat on the rise, uh, when you look at the mix of production, development, science and technology programs, there really has not been a consistent normalcy through that. Uh, looking at what the new normal looks like, though, uh, really makes you stand back and, uh, and take a deep breath. <clears throat> uh, for my business, uh, land and armaments, uh, since the peak of the wartime production, uh, by the end of 2014, we will have experienced a 75 percent reduction in staffing. 75% reduction in staffing. Uh, if you think, well, maybe that's just because of the wartime peak, uh, from 2013 to 2014, we'll see a 45% reduction in manufacturing hours and a 61% reduction in engineering hours. 
Uh, and I'll note that 2013 uh, was a level below what we previously considered economically sustainable. Uh, the impacts are real and they are immediate. <clears throat> um, what are we doing about it? How do we get through this? Uh, we have been very aggressively managing cost. Uh, while some of those switches may be locked out to the organic industrial base, uh, within land and armaments by the end of the year, we will have closed two major facilities, two major production facilities in Fairfield, Ohio and Sealy, Texas, uh, as well as a satellite facility in Fayette, Pennsylvania, uh, in addition to significantly downsizing the footprints uh, in York, Pennsylvania and Louisville, Kentucky, uh, which are our major remaining manufacturing sites. <clears throat> um, and I know I'm getting a number here. So what do you do about that? <coughs> we are refocusing. We're trying to identify what is that minimum core of capability that we need to maintain in order to be responsive to the Army's needs. Uh, can we do that with an engineering workforce as small as 250 engineers down from 2,500 several years ago? Uh, those are the realities we're facing. It causes us to refocus on what is core, uh, what do we as vehicle integrators and manufacturers uh, need to be able to do, how do we integrate new technologies and new processes, and frankly, how do we come out of this resized, reshaped, refocused, uh, so that when we come out of this downturn, uh, we are positioned to be able to support the Army and its future needs, because they will be there. Uh, so a little context from industry, and, and Mike, I'll leave you a little bit of time Mike, as if well. you can give it two or three minutes, we... I was going to tell some jokes, but I guess I don't have time. <laughs> General Dynamics Land Systems has been operating the Lima Army Tank Plant, now known as the Joint Systems Manufacturing Center, since the late 70s when it was opened, reopened, and refacilitized in order to start building the M1 Abrams tank. When your name and your company is associated with a facility for that long, everybody thinks it belongs to General Dynamics. It is a government-owned contractor-operated facility. In the process of that, the PM shop controlled the maintenance of the facility, any capital improvements, and uh, that was carried under separate contracts from the price of the tank. And we enjoyed a significant uh, competitive advantage for nearly two decades. A competitive advantage that General Dynamics never really took advantage of because we didn't compete on anything because we had sole source on the tank. Um, in 2001, the FAR went silent on cost plus and Cinefi facilities contracts. And with no place else to go, the PM told us we had to absorb those costs into the overhead and the cost of the tank, which was probably okay since we were running about 40 tanks a month through the tank plant, and it was a blip um, at that level. But something else happened in 2001. The Army reorganized significantly at the headquarters level, and it didn't become apparent to anybody what the impact of that was until it became very apparent to us in 2008 as we prepared to put a competitive bid in on the Israeli infantry carrier. We needed to have a lease price in order to build it at Lima. And so we went to the, where we always went when we needed a problem resolved, and that was to the PM shop. Well, they didn't have responsibility for establishing the lease price any longer. So we went to the TACOM commander. Well, he didn't have responsibility for establishing the lease price any longer. So we went to the Defense Contract Management Command, who actually has a government facility on Lima to manage the contract. They didn't have responsibility for establishing the lease price. We went to AMC headquarters. They didn't have responsibility for establishing the lease price. We were down the road pretty far in our bid process, so we had to bid something. So we went ahead and bid what we had on our previous FMS cases as a lease price. Finally, we went to the Installation Management Command to try to get the lease price. No, they didn't have responsibility for it. We ended up, and believe this or not, the Corps of Engineers who built the plant in the 40s. 
they had responsibility for establishing the lease price now. How's that happened? I don't know because they had no idea how to establish the lease price. It took them six more months and it was significantly above what we put in our fixed price bid to the Israelis. That's kind of the things that we're dealing with as a government-owned contractor operated facility and the disconnect between what's going on and who owns the facility versus what's going on and actually having to do something inside that plant to manufacture capability for the United States Army are two different things and have caused a huge disconnect, which has now manifested itself in the press because it looks like General Dynamics is at odds with the United States Army, and that is absolutely not the case. So you've got to ask yourself, are we part of the organic base or is it just that brick and mortar that sits in Lima, Ohio? I know uh, that uh, our time is up, so we, uh, I have uh, a series of questions here which, unfortunately, we won't have time to answer. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, just ask the questions and leave but, them hanging. But, but we had great PowerPoint. And uh, so the, uh, but, but I think it's important, at least for the audience, to understand what the questions are. Maybe these panelists can take them home as rhetorical questions, right? And, and you can answer them on your own. But, but, but the gist of all these questions, uh, that I've gotten here and appear mostly from the industry folks in the crowd is, is that there seems to be more of a focus on what is happening with the organic base than what's happening with industry. And unlike uh, the organic base, which are government facilities and government workers, as Mark and Mike have talked about uh, from uh, GD and BAE, at least on the ground side, uh, the, the commercial base will disappear. And, and when you need it again, you, the government, and all of us used to be in the government uh, sitting up here before, uh, it won't be there because there is no Depo Act, there is no Arsenal Act to protect them. So um, it's a very big concern on industry's part. As Mark said, he's already reduced 75%. Uh, um, there's a general feeling in industry that the focus within the Army is how do we protect our facilities, our organic at the expense of the commercial industry, which will disappear. And the next conflict, we won't be there for you. Um, so I just take uh, offer that again. Sorry for the people in the crowd, but that's the gist of almost every question we got. And I'll leave it to the panelists to uh, take it home as homework assignment. Okay, Jamie. Jamie. Look, you get the questions to the folks on the panel, and we'll make sure that everybody gets the answers okay, that, they, that you all sketch out. Okay, I think we need to address those questions. But at this afternoon at 1415, we have a panel. It's industrial partnering for Force 2025 and beyond. And some of the questions will be answered there. And I think if we can uh, roll those questions over and highlight will, the fact these were the questions we can uh, have a dialogue 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 here okay and i think okay. uh you know we're piecing it together here well thank you i would like to i see Ms. shu has walked in i'd like to thank the panelists and i also like to uh, say one thing uh thank ray mason he's going to be retiring here after 35 plus years in the army and thanks ray for all you've done for the army sir so.